tried to make the crunch time plays. Now your host, Bennett Gainey. Bennett Gainey. The little crunch, crunch, crunch time plays. I'm Jordan Black, and you're watching and listening to Crunch Time Plays. Howdy! My name is Jennifer Streeter. This is Andrea Carter. Taylor McGregor here. Jim Bradford here. Hey, all this is Caroline Fenton. Hey, everybody, this is Courtney Mims from Pig Trail Nation, and you're watching and listening to Crunch Time Plays. Hey, it's Jim Dunaway from the next round, and when it comes down to the final ticks on the clock, I always look for Crunch Time Plays. Welcome in, everybody. It's time to make crunch time plays. The Ohio State Buckeyes are 9-0, and currently ranked number two in the college football playoff rankings and <clears throat> having a very good recruiting class as well. We're going to dive into all of that with our buddy Steve Hellwagon from 24-7 Sports, ButtNuts.com. Steve, I don't know if you know this, but you have officially broken the record for guest appearances on crunch time plays. So congratulations on that, my friend. I hope you're doing well. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm hanging in, just running around town here. We had basketball stuff, football stuff today, and, um, you know, never a dull moment here with uh, covering these teams. So, yeah, it's uh, it's been real busy. <laughs> no doubt about it. Well, to start off with, I wanted to ask you about JT Tuomoal because we, we made him a crunch time player a couple weeks ago for his – obviously he had a – incredible performance against Penn State but I feel like outside of outside of Columbus he kind of got forgotten a little bit since he was his you know recruitment went past signing day during the during the COVID cycle he obviously picks Ohio State the number one ranked player in that class but to, to me he kind of got overlooked a little bit outside of Columbus but man everybody knows about him again now after that performance against Penn State that he had. Yeah, he was one of the top five players in the country last year for the 2021 class and uh, didn't make his decision until July 4th, I think. And then, you know, all of the other freshmen were already on campus for at least a month and some of them all the way back to January. And so he shows up just in time for the start of the preseason camp. And he really didn't get a chance last year to make as big an impact, perhaps, as he might have. They had some veteran players. They had a defensive end, Tyreek Smith, who left and went to the NFL. They had Zach Harrison, who is still there now as a senior. Uh, his friend uh, Jack Sawyer, also a true freshman, was there. So they had some other guys, Javante Jean-Baptiste. And so he really didn't get to make much of a mark last year as a true freshman. But this year, uh, he and Jack Sawyer have kind of split uh, the number of starts through, uh, I guess it's nine games now at the one defensive end position with uh, Zach Harrison starting almost all of the other games at the other defensive end position. And what we came to see in weeks, I guess it would have been week eight against Penn State, big game on the road, and the Buckeyes are trailing in the second half. Uh, JT Tuamaloao had one of the greatest games any Ohio State defensive players ever had. Uh, Six tackles, three tackles for loss, two sacks, two interceptions, one for a touchdown, forced a fumble, which he also recovered, which set up a touchdown. He also tipped a pass that Zach Harrison intercepted as well. So he had a hand in all four of the turnovers in that game, forcing the fumble and recovering it, the two interceptions, and then tipping a pass for an interception. And I think they got, I'm going to say, 24. Four points maybe off of all those turnovers. So, and they needed all of them because it was a tight game there at Penn State. So, uh, he really uh, played up to his ranking, I would say, in that one game. And uh, now Ohio State fans are hoping he can continue to, to play close to that. I think it'd be, as we said, one of the great defensive games in Ohio State history. Hard to match that one. I don't know if he ever will. I don't know what what you could do for an encore after that is score two touchdowns or or whatever, but uh, on defense. But uh, you know, just a just a, an amazing performance, and he's uh, he's been an outstanding player, you know, through high school and uh, a good guy as well. Uh, really learning a lot from Larry Johnson, the defensive line coach there at Ohio State. 
No doubt. It was certainly an incredible performance. And the reason I, I brought that up first, the individual performance was to kind of, kind of, turn it into a broader conversation about the defense overall. Ryan Day, we talk about making crunch time plays all the time. Ryan Day made a pretty big one, bringing in Jim Knowles as the defensive coordinator this year. Obviously, he wasn't satisfied with the defensive performance the last couple of years, and it's really paid off. I mean, you look, the defense has you know, pretty much won them two games playing complimentary football. You got the first game against Notre Dame and then the, the Penn State game. It, it, defensive – have moves that really paid off uh, for Ryan Day and the decision that he made. Yeah, Jim Knowles came in from Oklahoma State and had done a great job uh, putting a good defense on the field at Oklahoma State, got them to the Big 12 championship game last year, lost to Baylor, obviously. Um, 21 to 16, it wasn't anything that his defense, you know, really contributed to. Um, comes in and inherits a lot of veteran players, and they were willing to accept this new scheme. And I think you coupled their experience that they had last year, taking on, taking some lumps last year for the defense for the Buckeyes, being a year older and smarter and faster and stronger and bigger and all that stuff through the program. And then uh, the scheme that they're put in, it's been a home run so far for Ohio State uh, defensively. They're in the top 10, uh, I think, both offensively and defensively. I don't have all the exact numbers in front of me, but really from about the second or third game on, they've been uh, top 10 in both sides of the, 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 the field. And one of the few teams, I think Georgia may also be uh, one of those teams as well, that that uh, has a, a top 10 unit on both sides of the ball. So uh, that's why these teams are at the top of the polls and the top of the list. And this is why the committee, you know, as they wear the way these teams out, looks at it and says Ohio State can do both. They can score points and they can defend. And that's why they're ranked ahead of the other two uh, undefeated teams, Michigan and TCU, and certainly ahead of all the one loss teams as well. So uh, to me, other other than Georgia, of course, and I think Georgia, uh, certainly their play has uh, earned them the number one spot. And I figure if they went out, uh, beat LSU in the championship game, uh, presumably um, they would be number one going into the playoff as well. But, uh, you know, I just think that, uh, what Knowles has done has been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, if they're able to finish this off, you know, he could be a candidate for the Broyles Award as the top assistant in the country because of the quantum leap that they have made. They they gave up roughly 24 points a game last year, 22, 23 points a game, something like that. And they've got that down. I think it's probably down around 15 or 16 this year. So they've shaved a whole touchdown and a little bit more off that average from a year ago. No doubt. And, and, it's just been it's been amazing what what they have been able to do and and kind of switching over you know to the offensive side now before we get into uh, the other things I have for you is you talk about Jim Knowles being a great uh, defensive coordinator over there on that side but but Brian Hartline the wide receivers coach on the offensive side has has really established himself not only. Uh, on the field, but in, in recruiting as well. I know we'll, we'll get to that uh, in the second half of the show when we talk about recruiting coming up. But but Marvin Harrison Jr., to me, I think he's he's probably the best receiver in college football right now. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, he has had a fabulous season. Uh, he had three touchdown catches in the Rose Bowl, and he had three touchdowns in the first four or five games uh, twice. Uh, early in the season, nobody at Ohio State had ever had more than two, three touchdown games in their career. That was Joey Galloway back in the, uh, geez, when was that? That would have been the early 90s. I have to think about which decade that even was. Nobody had ever had uh, multiple three touchdown games other than Joey Galloway. So then Marvin Harrison does it, and then he did it again, and he became the first guy in OSU history with three three touchdown games, and he did it in his first seven starts at Ohio State. He's still got another year to go next year, obviously, as a sophomore this year. So he is a self-made man. Obviously, uh, he came from great stock. His dad, NFL Hall of Famer, Marvin Harrison, and uh, his mom was also an outstanding athlete as well in her own right. 
And yet he has worked so hard at his craft to put himself in this position. They say he's one of the hardest working guys in the program and really kind of sets a standard for other people. They asked him today, you know, how do you keep getting better? He says, you just do more than you did, did last week. And you think about that, you know, that's extra 10 minutes on the jugs machine or whatever. And he's just putting in more and more. And when we left today, he was still out there on the field all by himself working on the jugs machine. And this is why he's going to be an all American and potentially the bullet in a cough award winner this year, because he is out working the competition and then he gets into these games and going against Ohio state's defensive backs, prepare him to go up against anybody that he sees in the country and the games are easier for him probably than, than a lot of the practices are. So, uh, you know, it, it uh, he he's just uh, been fabulous and obviously it goes without saying when you have arguably the best quarterback in the country throwing you the football, then it, it makes life a little simpler. Uh, they all had it very hard last week at Northwestern trying to throw the ball in the 30, 40 mile an hour winds up there. But uh, uh, other than that game, there have been very few teams that have put a put a stop on that Ohio State offense. No doubt. And and it kind of brings up an interesting point. You mentioned C.J. Stroud and when you kind of bring in the Heisman race into, into focus a little bit, it seems like the Heisman race is going to, especially for him, is obviously going to come down up to that game against Michigan uh, at the end of the year. But but where was where would he stack up as far as right now uh, in that race? Because to me, he's still – pretty high without without that game uh, against Michigan. But if he really shows out in that game, that's only going to vault him up to probably the top spot. Yeah, he kind of moved back into the top spot this week by default with Hendon Hooker and Tennessee losing. I think a lot of people thought that Hooker had kind of uh, edged ahead of him here in recent weeks, beating Alabama, beating LSU the way that they did, the numbers he's put up. He's been fabulous, and I hate to see that uh, one game, which you know may or may not have hinged on his play, is what people are going to use against him. I, I think you got to look at somebody's entire body of work for the season, and uh, there's probably somebody out there that we haven't even really thought about. Maybe a Bo Nix at Oregon, or I don't even know, uh, you know, somebody else out there that, well, obviously Blake Gorham from Michigan, the running backs having that type of a season as well, storybook year. But, uh, you know, somebody could come out of nowhere and steal this thing in the last three weeks. It happens like that quite often. Uh, Stroud's got an opportunity. They're playing Indiana this week. Uh, the conditions this week are going to be cold. It's actually 70 degrees today in Columbus, but on Saturday the high is going to be about 43 the wind won't be quite as bad as it was last week against Northwestern, but conditions should be good for him to put up big numbers uh, against Indiana. He threw for a big number last year and four touchdowns against them. So uh, and they beat him 54 to seven last year at Indiana. And I'm not sure Indiana is a whole heck of a lot better, especially with their quarterback situation, a little bit unsettled with Connor Basilak, a little dinged up this week. So could be, ton of opportunities for him. Then on the road at Maryland, uh, from an Ohio State standpoint, you hope that game doesn't become a shootout where Ohio State's defense has a problem trying to contain Tago Vailoa, although, you know, uh, they haven't played necessarily great football here, losing at Wisconsin last week. And then obviously the game that means everything. It'll be number two Ohio State, number three Michigan uh, to go to the Big Ten championship game and, and for a spot in the playoffs. So uh, I look at it that uh, – you know, if he's going to win the Heisman Trophy, he's going to go out the next three weeks and win it on the field. And, and obviously on the fast track in Indianapolis for the Big Ten Championship, whether they're playing any one of the five teams from the Big Ten West that still have a chance to get there, he's going to put up big numbers in that game, I would think. So uh, and that'll be the last time anybody uh, sees him play. So he's got four games left to state his case. And if he can lead Ohio State to a 13-0 record and play pretty well in these last four games, I, I don't know who's going to come come along and, and knock it away from him. I really don't. No, I don't. I don't either. And and you mentioned the the teams on the west side. I want to get to that in just a second. But first, kind of looking around, you know, kind of the landscape of the offense for Ohio State. The offensive line has been a little bit inconsistent at times, but. How would you how would you evaluate their their play through through the first nine games and 
And when you when you start to to look ahead, obviously the team can't afford to look past Indiana and and Maryland, but but we can, you know, just since we're not in the locker room. But but whenever you start looking, whenever you kind of start looking ahead against Maryland, if you get into a shootout against Michigan, how would you how would you rate the the offensive line's performance so far? I'd say B plus. I think they've done fine. I think that uh, uh, they haven't allowed maybe seven sacks in nine games, which is a hell of a number. Uh, Penn State, the Iowa games prior to Northwestern, they really struggled running the football. And for about two and a half quarters against Northwestern, they really struggled running the football. But then they finally unleashed C.J. Stroud to to run the ball, and that gave them a little bit more balance in the running game. They ended up netting over 200 yards in a game that everyone says they couldn't run it. Well, they still ended up with 200 yards, and they won the game 21-7. to So... All's well that ends well. That's kind of the motto here this week in Columbus is that, no, it wasn't pretty. And, and yes, the conditions were miserable. But and I think Northwestern was was better prepared uh, schematically, you know, for what Ohio State was was bringing to that game. They, they stacked the run. Uh, obviously, Ohio State could not throw the ball. He ended up with a, a career low 77 yards or something. And uh, for about two and a half quarters, Mayan Williams wasn't getting anything done. They were getting slammed for no gain on third down. People have put a lot of this on the offensive line, but I think it's predictability with the play calling. I think it's um, a lot of things that the opponent's putting eight or nine men in the box and in and, and, and a couple of these more recent games. And Ohio State, you hate to hear somebody say this, but – they're almost in a posture where they have to run the ball or rather pass the ball effectively to set up the run. And you never want to be in that posture. You want to be able on first down to line up, knock them off the line of scrimmage and go get six, seven yards. So now it's second and short, a predominant number of times, and you're able to dictate to the defense, this is how we're going to attack you now because we've got the advantage in down and distance. And Ohio State really the last three weeks has kind of struggled with that. Against Iowa, there were struggles in the red zone, settled for four field goals in the first half. Uh, Penn State, they just never really were able to run the ball at Penn State. Uh, Travion Henderson, Mayan Williams, the running backs, have been in and out of the lineup with injuries. Henderson missed the Northwestern game. No idea whether he's going to try and give it a go uh, this week against uh, Indiana or not. Guess we'll tune in Saturday and find out. Mine Williams played hurt. I thought at Northwestern they never put the freshman Dallin Hayden in the game. So you kind of left with what you're left with at this point. They couldn't run it. They couldn't throw it. And it, it was pretty ugly for about a half or so there at Northwestern. And they took them seven possessions to score a touchdown. And I can't imagine when the last time an Ohio State Ryan Day team back to even when he was just the coordinator for Urban Meyer struggled that badly um, with the football. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of things going wrong. And again, this is Indiana. They're three and six. Uh, are they just playing out the string at this point? Because postseason seems off the table for them. 40 point underdog at Ohio State. Ohio State needs to go out, take care of business, and get back to running the football the way that they expect to be able to run it. No doubt. And I want to I want to look ahead to the Michigan game and the, and the Big Ten Championship possibility here in a second. But you mentioned kind of the predictability of the, the play call and different things like that. To, to me, it's when you're in the, the rarefied air that Ohio State has been in for the – especially in the, you know, in the playoff era, they've been, you know, several times now and, and obviously one of the top teams – in the country to me it's almost like people are or j- when you're in the rarefied air that ohio state is in they just try to try to pick holes uh, in a in a team especially when people were talking about the offensive line against northwestern they couldn't get a push on you know third and one short yardage situations i mean to me all these teams are in kind of super bowl mode when they're playing ohio state and especially in those conditions it's really hard to to kind of ex- exude your will when you're stacking the box with nine or 10 guys, especially when it's, you know, 30 mile an hour wind, you obviously know their state's going to try to run the football. And so to me, combining all that, it seems like a lot of times when you're in the rarefied air that Ohio state is in, people always try to, to try to pick you apart with a, 
a finer tooth comb than they do other teams. Yeah, you make a really good point. They scored 21 points in the first game of the year against Notre Dame, then just 21 points this past game against Northwestern. They set a new major conference FBS record with their 70th consecutive game with 20 points. Oklahoma had the old record of 69, and as we're sitting there watching the game on Saturday and they're stuck on seven and they're stuck on 14, you're wondering, are they even going to get to 20 or 21 to break this record? And they scored a touchdown with about five, six minutes to go to finally put it away. Uh, The 44-yard run by Stroud got it down into the inside the 10. And then it was unfortunate for him. He kept it and went left and tried to get in and couldn't get there. They gave it to Mayan Williams, and he knocked it in the end zone, and they got the 21 points. So they get this record. But, again, as I said, as it took them seven possessions to score their first touchdown, out of the 70 games where they scored at least 20 points, this was probably the most difficult, (laughs) the one where it was most in doubt that they were going to get to 20 points. And uh, somehow they did. In the interim seven games after Notre Dame, they had scored 40 or more points in every game, which was believed to be, according to Big Ten Network, a all-time Big Ten record that nobody had ever, no Big Ten school, regardless if it was a conference game or non-conference or whatever, had ever scored 40 or more points in seven consecutive games. So, you know, you kind of add it all together And so you have a game where they don't score 40 points. I mean, the Penn State game was 44, which was as few as they've scored in forever. I mean, going back weeks, you know. And so when you get 21 after all these weeks of 40, people are like, what's going on here? And and obviously the weather, the passing game, all that had something to do with it. But uh, you're right. When when you're so prolific and you put up numbers like they have – uh, if, if you falter for even one or two possessions, don't score in the red zone like they did against Iowa to that degree. Um, you know, it, it, it adds up. It adds up a little bit. So um, I don't know. They, they um, I, I keep kind of saying they're going to be fine because they've got Stroud, they've got Harrison, they've got Henderson and, and Mayan Williams. They're, they're going to be fine, but I'd really like to see them you know, go out this week and, and exert their will on Indiana, go out to Maryland, play a really the onus at Maryland's going to be more defensively. They've got to come up with a good plan to contain uh, Tylea Tagovailoa and not allow him to pick them apart because he could throw for 300 against anybody at the drop of a hat. So um, as we've seen, I mean, they, they played Michigan right down to the nub there back in September. So, um, could expect it to be a, a closer than expected game. No doubt. And, and when you're starting to, when you're starting to kind of look ahead and look at the game against Michigan, not, not diving into it too specifically, we can do that in a couple of weeks, you know, you know during game week, but kind of looking at it for just from a broad perspective, when you're kind of looking at it from a playoff standpoint, to me, it, the game means more to me Ohio State could could still work their way possibly back in with a with a loss but to me if Michigan loses to Ohio State they're probably going to be out of it just based on their resume so far what kind of what kind of way to do you see that uh playing out uh in when we're kind of looking at it you know, in the broader sense of what that game could mean as far as the playoff race goes? I think Michigan has a very good team. I think that uh, making the switch to McCarthy has kind of energized their offense a little bit. Blake Corum is playing as well as any Big Ten running back probably, you know, in in recent memory has played. Uh, They've been tested, though, you know, people will say, well, they played – Connecticut and uh, Hawaii and Colorado State in the non-conference. They didn't even play, you know, even a lower level ACC or Pac-12 or Big 12 team or whatever. I guess the the word is that they bought out a contract with UCLA for a home and home and didn't want to have to play them, apparently. Now, I, I use that they didn't end up playing them. I don't know what the circumstances were or who approached to, if it was UCLA or Michigan or mutual agreement or whatever, if the dates didn't work out or whatever. I don't know what the circumstances were. So let me 
retract that statement that they didn't want to play UCLA, but this will be two years in a row with no major conference, non-conference opponent as next year they're, they're not doing it either. So, you know, you can hold that against them all you want. I think at the end of the day, their schedule and Ohio State's schedule are going to be very comparable because Ohio State, yes, played Notre Dame, also played Toledo and Arkansas State. Toledo, one of the better teams in the MAC. Uh, Michigan has the advantage from the standpoint of playing Illinois, which has seven wins and could be the West champion, although losing to Michigan may open the door to somebody you know else stealing that division title and a tiebreaker or something at the end. But Ohio State isn't playing anybody from the West <clears throat> anywhere close to that that caliber as Illinois. I mean, you know, Iowa, Wisconsin, both five wins, I guess, right now or, or right around it or whatever. So and uh, Northwestern's one of the worst teams in, in the sport. So, um, you know, of the mutual they have four mutual opponents. And you take those four out that they've already played and take those out of the equation of the other five teams they played, Michigan's other five opponents have 18 wins. Ohio State's other five opponents have 20 wins. So the schedules really aren't as far apart as people might want to say. I know Notre Dame major conference. We don't even know if Notre Dame's going to end up in the top 25 because they've still got to play USC on the road. And, uh, you know, USC right now is a top 10 team. Uh, is eight and four going to be good enough for Notre Dame to finish in the top 25? They're going to settle this on the field. I think where this argument comes into play is for the loser. Do they have a valid case at 11 and one to backdoor their way into the playoff? I think it would take losses by some other people, uh, some other teams to, to potentially open that up uh, for them to have that opportunity. But, uh, you know, go out and win the game. And I think. Michigan's defense is starting to play really good football. I think Michigan, we saw they trailed Penn State or were tied 16-14. They were maybe ahead with Penn State and blew them out in the second half. Uh, this past week against Rutgers, had a block punt in the first half, 17-14 at halftime. Blew them out 38 to nothing in the second half. That's as good a football as any team in the country has probably played all season. So um, they've got a good team. they got to come to Columbus. The year is 2022. Michigan has not won in Columbus since the year 2000, which means most of the kids who are in college today have never seen uh, Michigan win a game in Columbus. So that just kind of writes itself right there. That is this the year they break through with what looks like a very good team, or is this just the status quo going forward again and Ohio State gets back in the win column uh, and holds serve at home? So I guess we'll have to wait a few more weeks on that one to be played out. But uh, I think McCarthy and Corum are going to test Ohio State's uh, defense, and certainly Stroud and his guys, they're going to they're gonna test uh, uh, Michigan's defense. Stroud led them to 27 points last year at Michigan, but – the Ohio State defense gave up 42, so it wasn't enough. No doubt, it's going to be a an incredible. It's going to be a pretty, pretty incredible uh, matchup. We talk about the rushing attack for Michigan and, and the passing attack for Ohio State, and and we when we, t- we talked about Illinois, we talked about a couple of those teams uh, from the West a little bit, but obviously most people view Ohio State and Michigan as the Big Ten championship game just because. No, the winner will be favored up. by at least two touchdowns in Indianapolis. So no, no doubt. And especially, on a fast track, I, I like Michigan or Ohio State to win that game comfortably. No, no doubt. Definitely. And when you look at the it, it's kind of kind of funny the way you look at it. Somebody somebody is gonna come out of the West, whether it's Illinois with two losses right now or or one of the four teams that has is in that cluster with three losses three in three. the big three yeah, losses three in the three. Big Ten. And so, to me, it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a, a, a contest to see who gets to be blown out by either Ohio State or Michigan. Yeah, we'll we'll see. Um, there are some interesting games. Obviously, I think Illinois and Purdue this week, Wisconsin and Iowa this week. So, if if Illinois is able to beat Purdue, um, you know. They, they would still have probably a one-game lead over some of those other teams, but they beat Wisconsin and Iowa head-to-head already. So it's kind of like – and they play Northwestern at the end. That's a guaranteed win. 
uh, in Michigan. So uh, they can actually give away the game to Michigan, finish nine and three and uh, six and three and win the division. So uh, because they would have the prevailing tiebreaker on everybody. So their loss was to Indiana. They've cleaned up in the division. They've beaten everybody in the division. They've got the tiebreaker on everybody. So. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and obviously Steve, Steve Hellwagon joins us from 24 seven sports making the crunch time plays with us. And just a reminder you at home, you make your crunch time play, like the video, subscribe to the channel. They're too free. They're the only things that we ask you to do around here, both free and, and Steve, whenever, before I get you out of here, we got to hit. I wanted to hit some recruiting stuff with you for Ohio State. Obviously, we're about a month away from the early signing period, which really is the has become the signing period over the last couple of years. Most most prospects choosing to go ahead and and sign in December. A lot you see seeing a lot of early enrollees over the last few years as well. And and to me, the when you look at Ohio State's class right now, obviously Brian Hartline's cleaning up. Uh, on the receivers of Brandon Ennis, Noah Rogers, Carnell Tate. Obviously, they're all three t- very, very quality receivers uh, in the class. Uh, that was that, obviously that, those are my favorite uh, parts of the the class for Ohio State. But but what are what are a couple of your you know obviously high spots in the class right now, and who are a couple of of prospects uh, that are still out there for the Buckeyes that we need to keep our eyes on over this next month. Yeah, I think the wide receivers are almost recruiting themselves at this point. When you look at Terry McLaurin now getting paid for the Washington team and then uh, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave going in the top 20 picks of the NFL draft and uh, doing well as rookies. And now you've got uh, Jackson Smith, the Jigba. Unfortunately, he's kind of the wild card. Maybe he'll come back for the Michigan game. Hamstring injury has kept him on the sideline for most of the year. This was supposed to be his All-American year. Turns out it was Marvin Harrison's. And then you got Emeka Buka and Julian Fleming and Jaden Ballard and the guys who signed last year who haven't even really had a chance to play this year. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun at wide receiver for Iowa State going forward. But uh, the class is ranked fifth nationally right now. Uh, the wide receivers are the, the leaders in that class with Dennis Rogers and Tate, all national top 70 players. And then Luke Montgomery is an offensive lineman from Finley, Ohio, which is up near Toledo. And uh, he's the top-rated offensive lineman in the class. That's a good one there. Jason Moore from Maryland, a big-time defensive end. Uh, So those are some of the leaders that I really like in this class. They needed some help in the corner position. Calvin Simpson Hunt from Texas is a guy that uh, is just on the cusp of being a national top 100 player. So he's there. And Malik Hartford, a safety from Lakota West down by Cincinnati as well. Uh, Those guys all really key pieces. Uh, They need help on the offensive line. And I think, uh, uh, as we mentioned, Montgomery is a key guy here, as well as Joshua Padilla from uh, Huber Heights Wayne down in Dayton, one of the top football schools in Ohio. So that kind of hits the high points of the guys that are in the class. That, uh, that I think you really got to like. They needed a quarterback in the class just to kind of balance things out. They've got Brock Glenn. He's not necessarily the most heralded, uh, highly ranked guy, at number 380 in the country. But when you think about behind Stroud, you've got a national top 50 guy with Kyle McCord, another national top 100 guy with Devin Brown from Arizona and Utah. He's a true freshman. Then you would have Brock Glenn next year as a freshman. And the following year, you've got, I think it's Dylan Rayola from Arizona, who is the number one overall prospect in the country. So already committed to Ohio State. So they're they're playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers on this whole recruiting thing. They're, they're already working hard on the, the 2024 cycle. But there is space left in this class. And really, it centers around defensive end. Um they got a kid, Keon Keeley, who they're very high on. Also, Damon Wilson. Those, those two guys are both from the SEC area. And then also Mateo Uigalili, whose brother, obviously, is the uh, the Clemson quarterback, uh, uh, EJ, DJ there. So uh, he was in Notre Dame uh, to see the game this past week with his dad. And uh, we'll see uh, how, how that all plays out uh, for him. And, and But Ohio State is a serious player for him. And obviously the Indiana game is this weekend and then the big one with Michigan. They will have a ton. My guess is between the 
23, 24, and 25 classes, they'll have over 20 or 25 national top 100 players in Columbus. It'll be a cavalcade of future NFL players that, you know, you don't know their names now, but you will one day, whether they're at Ohio State or not. But um, a ton of talent will be – there'll be as much talent on the sideline and in the front few rows watching that game as there will be out on the field. But uh, – uh, that's uh, that's the way it is right now at Ohio State uh, football recruiting. They sign one top five class after another, and it is the the material that you put into the blender is the result you get coming out of the blender. So that uh, that explains uh, why Ohio State has been perennially they're going for their tenth win. I can't even remember the last time they didn't have ten wins. It was probably the Luke Fickle year in 2011. So I think they were six and seven that year and they've had 10 wins every year since at least. So uh, I think more, more like 11 wins almost every year since. So, uh, you know, they've got a juggernaut going, that's for sure. No doubt. And especially uh, when you're obviously recruiting in the rarefied air that Ohio state does, obviously you're not, you're not necessarily worried about, you kind of you're kind of recruiting yourself, you know, like you were we were talking about with the wide receivers. But to me, it's really a big deal to to have that game against Michigan at home. Obviously, there's going to be a whole lot of prospects there, and to see that big of a game in the in the horseshoe, that's obviously I think going to be a big deal for a lot of those prospects as well. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, that atmosphere, if Ohio State's able to win the game, and the the people, excuse me, will. Um, Almost certainly rush the field and be a big party all weekend long, obviously, there in Columbus if they're able to beat uh, Michigan. But, uh, you know, like they say, you get to enjoy it for today, and then they'll have to get right back to work on whoever they're playing the following week. That's the one thing that, in terms of recruiting, when you're not in a conference championship game, your coaches actually go out and hit the road that week. For Ohio State, they may get one day on the road, uh, whatever day the players are taking off practice. And then those guys, uh, Urban always railed about that, how we were behind in recruiting because we had to coach this championship game. And it's like, well, you better coach well in the championship game because that's your entree to get to the playoff and everything else, So, which is what really matters as much as anything. So uh, it was always kind of a vicious cycle for them. Though. We're playing catch-up. There's 10 days to signing day, and we're, we're playing catch-up on these kids. We really had to work to close these kids this last week and whatever. And it's like, you know, first-world problems, I guess. So, you know, what can you do? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, to me, it's uh... – it seems like why I feel like there's a lot of momentum. I don't know. If, I don't know if it'll ever happen or not in the next couple of years. But there seems like there's a lot of momentum to push that early signing period to the summer. You know, it would help with those the coaches that play in conference championship games as well as as coaches that are you know on the move, hiring and firing coaches, different things like that. So to me that'll yeah. be interesting to see if that gets any traction here coming I up. I think from a player standpoint it'd be nice to lock up your scholarship in writing before you go out and play a down of football as a high school senior because you could break your leg and you know or blow out your knee or whatever or you know have some kind of debilitating injury and it's nice to know that they they're still going to honor your scholarship one way or the other. So uh, I know that's kind of morbid thinking, but I think that's that's also real world thinking too for these kids to protect them. Uh, if they've earned a scholarship, there's no reason why, and they want to sign their that, that away before their high school season. I really believe they should be able to do that because, um, you know, with the proviso that if the coach leaves or you know something some some terrible something terrible happens, you know then then, um, you know, maybe the position coach leaves or whatever, then you can, uh, you can reopen. But uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of players' rights in this whole thing. I believed in the transfer portal, instant eligibility, NIL, all that stuff. I mean, I think that uh, anything that can be done, and that's why we're getting to this point where they want to have this playoff creep, why they're taking it, you know, two extra rounds in the first go round from four to 12, I don't understand that. Why are you? Why don't you go to eight and see how that works before you try to tack on another round? Because they're going to screw up the entire football schedule doing this. They're either going to start the season a week earlier in August and play the championship games Thanksgiving weekend, and then 
first round of the playoff a week or two after that, and then semifinals, whatever and whatever and whatever, and this thing's going to go on and on. And they're not – there's no flip side here to take care of the student athletes. And, uh, you know, I'm going to have to maybe play as many as 16 games or something stupid. I mean, it's just maybe 17 games if, if you're, you know, 12 plus the conference championship and four playoff games. You know, that's a lot of football and, and you know, for what? So, I don't know. We'll, we'll set all those issues another day, but uh, kind of sticky mess they've gotten themselves into here. Yeah, definitely. We we'll definitely have to uh, definitely have to to settle those in the in the years to come, obviously. But but for this you know, year, here's the other thing: they're all so greedy they can't dis- can't decide who's going to televise it. And you got conferences pulling for Fox to get involved in it before the existing contract ends. And the other conferences are saying no, we're sticking behind ESPN. And you know they're so greedy that they you know they can't agree to even fix this for next year when, when it should be eight or 12 next year. So whatever, you know, <laughs> no, it's, it's always, it's always amazing to me that the, you no, know, obviously we're, total greed. We're in the, we're in the greedy uh, era with the, with the new TV deals and, and all that. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that sounds great and all, but to me is as just a person that loves college football, I don't care about any of that stuff. Like you can do, yeah, we just we just care about Saturdays in the fall and and yep. and, and it, you know I used to be I used to be somebody that thought an expanding playoff would be would be a good idea but but now for a for a, a variety of reasons I really don't I really don't yeah. see I really don't see I'm okay with now. the status quo I'm okay with it because you know I was at Northwestern this past week and their whatever their record was one and whatever and their people still turned out even though the weather was bad they were tailgating in the bad weather and everything and what did those people what supporting that team have to really look forward to i mean they are so far away from this other end of the sport and yet you know they want to go out on saturdays and and enjoy it and support their team but they're kind of like they just keep button up against this glass ceiling that uh, it's like TCU. It took an act of God to move an undefeated TCU team into the top four. If their name of their team was Texas or Oklahoma, they'd be number two or number three. You know, I mean, give me a break. You know, it, it, I'm tired of the – I'm not tired of the halves dominating. I'm tired of the halves getting all these advantages for no reason over – you know, all these other schools that, that are doing things the right way and just can't catch a break sometimes. Yeah, there's definitely no doubt about that. Well, Steve, it's always a pleasure having you. We always have a, a great conversation. And yep. tell everybody where we can find you on social media and tell everybody where they can find your work uh, as well, because obviously you do an amazing job. You're you're the seasoned season veteran of Ohio State uh, coverage, yep. covering it for was it 30 is 38 years now, right? Well, uh, basketball 35 and football full time for about 28, I think, something along those lines. I actually started covering the basketball full time as a student in 1988 89. So this is the 35th year consecutively that I've done that. I wasn't really full time on football till about 95. So uh, I did some part time stuff with it previously, but didn't go home and away, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, BuckBets.com, 24-7 Sports Network, at Steve Hellwagon, as you can see it on the screen uh, with Twitter. And, uh, yep, anything involving Ohio State, we got it. So come and check it out. No doubt. That's going to do it for us on Crunch Time Plays today. Thanks so much for being with us. Make sure before you head out to subscribe to the channel, like the video as well, and as always, make Crunch Time Plays. God bless everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Crunch Time Plays with your host, Thanks for tuning in to Crunch Time Plays with your host, Bennett Ganey. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow at Plays Crunch on Twitter and Instagram.